I freed them. All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and start. In our class, we're gonna have games, we're gonna have lectures, we're gonna have stuff like that. So you'll be doing stuff at your desk and I'll be throwing stuff on the board. The first section we're gonna look at are basically their graphs. What is a graph? First thing we look at, when we talk about graphs, what does that mean to you? What is a graph in reality? We all know them, we all do them, but what's a graph? Does it have to be a line? It could be dots. It could be a curve. It could be anything. But okay, basically, you're yeah, that's right. Right in one one instance, basically, a graph is a pictorial representation of a function or an equation. Of an equation. Or function. Okay, right off the bat, I threw two more words in there. Good morning. Right off the bat, I threw two more words at you. Equation and function. What's the difference? What are they? Actually, last class, we talked about equations. You have either an equation or an expression. What's the difference? What's the difference between equation versus an expression? Equations have an equal sign. And expressions do not have an equal sign. So because this has an equal sign, you're asked to solve for an answer or a variable. In other words, you won't be finished until your variable equals some number. That's when we know when we have an equation, you're not done until that variable is by itself. An expression, all you do here is simplify the expression. How do you simplify it? You combine like terms. Okay, what do we mean by like terms? What is a term? What is a term? Yeah, there are letters and numbers. Yeah, it's basically a term is Anything separated by a plus, minus, or equal sign. Letters and numbers or combination or both. Actually, just in the first two minutes of this class, we see the importance of knowing the definitions. Because mathematics is a language. If you know the language, the words, it's easy. Because each one of these words have a specific meaning. 
If I say solve the equation, you know the equation has to have an equal sign. What do you have to do? You have to solve for it. So this, um, if anything, it's important to learn what these words mean. Or if you see the word solve, or if you see the equal, equal sign, you don't have to read the instructions. You know it's going to tell you solve. And that's what we're going to try to do in this class is show you guys how to do all this stuff, no matter how big or how small the equation is. And we, we didn't even need equations. I can give you some just some numbers. Points on a graph. You can tell me the equation of that function. Or if I give you the graph, you can tell me the equation. Okay, now, also here, we have equations. We talked about, well, what is a function? What is a function? A function is another way of representing an equation where the value of the variable is defined. in the equation. So basically, functions and equations are the same thing. They're just, they just look different. Here, let me, let me start from the top for you. Get it? And here's the bottom part. You're welcome. And I apologize for last week, everyone. Last week was super hectic. I'm getting everything back down to normal. I will start putting this stuff up daily instead of it took me till Saturday or Sunday to get the stuff up because I, I've been swamped with answering students' questions that didn't bother attending class or watching the online stuff. So they're asking questions. What do we do for homework? What if I miss? I, mean, do I answer that same question maybe a thousand times. I apologize, but now I'm back on course. So let me see, let me show you. An equation looks like this. Or it could be that. As long as we have an equal sign in there, that's an equation. Another way of writing an equation would be that. A function, the difference between an equation and a function, it says, remember, in, the, in a function, the variable is predefined. So in a function, it looks like this, something like this. You know, they're the same thing. They both have the same equation. Only thing different is this first part. I know this is a function because that in front of the parentheses is the function name. name of the function. And whatever's inside here is the value of the variable in the equation. Any questions what that means so far?
I'm just going through the basic definitions right now. And, and we're, if you don't understand it, don't worry about it. We'll catch up with when we do examples and stuff. But I just want to put this out there right now so we know what we're dealing with. Let's look at an example here. If I gave you an equation, here's an example. The equation is y equals 3x plus 2. You can't tell me what y equals until I tell you what x equals. Until you know what that number is there, you can't do the work. True? Can you tell me what y equals without knowing what x is? No. So what if I said if x equals Four. Tell me what y equals. If a equals four, if x equals four, then y equals what? Mm -hmm. How'd you get 14? Yeah, because what I did was I defined what the X was. I said, X is four. So we have anywhere I see an X, I put a four. That's what X equals. So anywhere I see an X, I put a four. Three times four is 12, plus two is 14. So Y equals 14. Pretty straightforward. That's a lot of writing. And here's the benefit of a function. I'm gonna give you the same thing, but now we use a function. What's the name of the function? Whatever the letter is, that's the name of the function. This function is named f. I could have h. I could have g. So whatever letter is out here is the name of the function. Whatever's inside here is what? Whatever's inside the parentheses, what does that define? This defines value of x defines x or the value of x. So anywhere I see an x in the equation, what do I put in its place? Anywhere I see an x, I put a four. So it tells me here, What if I had, so I do the same thing there. Three times four is 12 plus two. So F of four is 14, same thing. What would H equal? What, what's the value of H then? Very good. Whatever's inside the parentheses goes in place of my variable. So it's three times six plus two. So three times six is 18 plus two is 20. So the, the value of H is 20. Very good. So I'm just throwing this out at you because I want you to stress the importance of learning your definitions of the words. Whenever I define a word in your notes, you, what you should do is put all the definitions in one highlight color to color. 
Examples, make them another highlight color. Formulas, make them another color. Why? Because when you, when you start flipping through your notes, in about three or four weeks, you're going to have about 40 pages of notes. And when you flip through them now, it'll all look the same. It's all black and white. But if you have highlights in there, you'll note your mind, your eyes will go pretty quick to what you're looking for. If you're looking for a formula, if you're looking for a procedure, if you're looking for a definition, you know what you're looking for. You can save, you can save yourself so much time. So heads up, get yourself some highlighted markers or even crayons and just underline them or highlight them. But have your own schema where you could define definitions, equations, uh, examples, formulas, and step-by-steps. Okay, so that is my lesson for the first part of stressing the importance of learning the definitions of the words. I mean, think of this way. If, if you're at work and your boss says, can you go and empty the coin register? What would you do? If your boss said, go empty the coin register, what would you do? What is a coin register? Nobody knows. Okay, don't get a job there then. What if the okay, what if the boss said take the trash out? That's every issue that is. What is what are you gonna do? Take out the trash. Again, you have to know what words are being used in this industry. And here we are. And we're gonna be learning them all throughout the semester. Every class period, you will learn new words. The faster you memorize what these words mean, the easier it's going to be. Because mathematics in itself is just a bunch of steps. A, B, C, D. Just knowing what steps to do. All right. In the beginning, we're going to talk about graphs. In the beginning, what kind of graph did you learn? What was the very first graph you learned? Did that ring a bell? What is it called? It's a line, but what kind of line? It's a number line, very good. Because what did the number line teach you? It taught you, well, you start off with zero. Anything to the right is what? Positive or negative? It's positive. So you go one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth, all the way to infinity. So if to the right is positive, that means to the left has to be negative. all the way to negative infinity. And those even have words. What is the natural number? You've heard it before, right? Natural number, whole number, integer, well, I mean, there's like six where there's where rationals, there's real numbers, there are complex numbers, imaginary numbers, there's a whole bunch of them. But let's start with this first three. What's the difference between these three? Ah, you forgot what you learned in elementary school. First grade. Natural numbers have another name. Counting numbers. Natural numbers are also called counting numbers. When I ask you to count to 10, what would you do? What would you start from? One, 
So these numbers are our natural numbers. Numbers that start with one and go to infinity. Because if you were to start counting, you start at one, two, three, four, five. But then what does zero come in? Zero looks like a hole, doesn't it? That's what brings these in. So from zero to infinity, these are all your whole numbers. You start from a hole and go on to infinity. Integers starts from negative infinity and goes on to positive infinity. So these are all the numbers. Integers do not have decimals. Although, every number is a fraction. Because of that, every number has a decimal. What does that mean? So let's look at number four. Can four be written as a fraction? What is four divided by one? It's a fraction. Yes. So anything can be written. If there's nothing, if there's nothing below a number, it's automatically just a one. If there's nothing below a number, it's a one. So since it's a fraction, it can be written as decimal. This is also equal to 4.0. So all of these re relate to each other. Fractions are called rational numbers. So fractions are like this. They're called rational numbers. Why are they called rational? Because what are the first five letters of rational? Ratio. Ratio simply means a fraction. And since it could be written as a decimal, we call these real numbers. Real numbers are anything, anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. Any number between there. In any format, any shape, any, as long as the numbers exists, it's a rational, it's a real number. If it's not real, what is it? In real in in reality, if it's not real, it's what? If it's not real, it's imaginary. It's one or the other. It can't be both. An imaginary number has the letter I after it for imaginary. And here's a great definition. The, the definition of imaginary numbers, not real. If I asked you to define imaginary numbers, not, not a real number. That's all it is to it. It's just the opposite of real numbers. If it's not a real number, it's imaginary. If it's not imaginary, it's real. It has to be one of the others. 
So together, both of these make up what's called a complex number. A complex number looks like this. Remember, complex is made up of real and imaginary. So the first part is the real part, and the second part is the imaginary. So learn anything new today? Don't know. You've heard it before. You just relearned it. Can we graph imaginary numbers? In your head, you can, but you can't put it down on a piece of paper. Because imaginary numbers would be out here. It's in the, in the imaginary plane. So real numbers, we can graph that. So that's the reason we have this number line. Number lines are made up of real numbers. So let's move on from there. So we have a number line where zero is in the middle, positives to the right, negatives to the left. Oops. We call this the x-axis. Because think about it, when you're in elementary school, you first learn the number line. If I ask you to put a dot on the number three, how would you do it? Where would you start? Start at zero. Three, is it positive or negative? Positive, so we go one, two, three. We put a dot there. That's it. If I ask you to to put a dot on three. We can also do math. Three plus two equals what? How does this equal five? How do we learn it doing five? Well, we learn it this way. Here's zero, one, two, three. So we start at zero, one, two, three. And then we add. Add means go to the right. How many more spaces? One, two. Two. So that's the reason it equals five. Four minus two. Start at zero, go to positive four. One, two, three, four. Minus means go which direction? Left, how many spaces? One, two. So that's the reason. Again, all this stuff we learned in elementary school. But that's how we move numbers around. Pretty boring. What do we what do we do next? Going horizontally, that's pretty boring. What do we do next? We start going vertically. Think about how, how humans travel. They walked, they rode horses, bicycles, wagons, chariots, everything's horizontal. Then came airplanes and submarines. We had a vertical axis now. It's everything to the right is positive all the way to positive infinity. Everything to the left is negative. All the way to negative infinity. So that means zero is right there. What do you think up is, positive or negative? Up is positive. So we go up one, up two, up three, 
up four. So and all the way up to positive infinity. So that means down is negative. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, all the way down to negative infinity. What do we call that? Does anybody remember the name of this thing? Well, yeah, we definitely we call, call it a graph. But a graph, remember, a graph by definition is a numerical, uh, is a pictorial representation of, a, of an equation or a function. There's not really a graph because there's no dots on there. What do we call the horizontal axis? What comes first, X or Y? So that's what we call the x-axis. And then the vertically? We don't call it a graph. We call it, it's actually, it's called this. A Cartesian coordinate system. It's called a Cartesian coordinate system, or some call it the XY graph or XY chart. The reason it's called a Cartesian coordinate system, there's a guy named Rene Descartes, a French philosopher, mathematician, scientist, was sick one day. He was in bed. He was looking up. He saw a spider on his ceiling. He said, how do I tell somebody where that spider is? He thought, well, from that corner, I can count this many rows of the beams going this way and this many this way. So he came up with a, a grid system. That's how he came up with this. He invented this so he can tell anybody exactly where a, an object is on his ceiling. And that's what we've been using ever since. All uh, the Rene Descartes, the same guy. I don't know if you ever heard "cogito ergo sum." I think, therefore, I am. You ever hear that? I think, therefore, I am. He's the one who came up with that phrase. Okay, so there's our graph. We have to. We, we know the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. We have four. What are these? These are called quadrants. We have four quadrants. A quadrant is this box, this box, this box, this box. How do you think they numbered them back then? Where do you think quadrant one is? Top right? Okay, this is quadrant one. Where's quadrant two? Quadrant three? Quadrant four. Interesting. You're right. Would we do it this way today? No, this is not clockwise. We do everything clockwise nowadays. Why is it counterclockwise? If you think about it, the words in the word clock, the hints in the word clock. Back in the 1600s, 1700s, did they have clocks like we do nowadays? What do they use? Sundials. They use sun, the sundial. And where does, in the sundial, the day begins when the sun comes up, right? Where does the sun come up? In, in where we are, east, north, south, east, or west, where does the sun rise? The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. This is north and this is south. So if it rises in the east and sets in the west, that's the reason it's numbered that way. That's the only thing they knew back then. So to them, counterclockwise was clockwise. 
So we have four quadrants. Now let's talk about a point. What is a point? What is a point? A point is a location on the grid, on, on this chart. I'm calling it a grid. I'm going to put a dot there. I'm going to put a point there. A point is the same thing as a dot. It's the location. So what is the location of that dot? Yeah. The location of this dot is 2, 3. It's written this way, specifically this way. We call that an ordered pair. An ordered pair is the location of a dot on your grid, on your graph. X always goes first, then Y. How about that location? Negative three and one. This one. Negative two, negative one. And then this one. One, negative three. Very good. Because what do you call this one? Which location? Zero, zero. The point zero, zero has a name. What's the name of it? Besides center. It's called the origin, yeah. The origin is the location of zero, zero. Why is it called the origin? Because that's where we start. Remember how we did the, the number line thing? Start at zero, add four, subtract two. We do the same thing here with this. If I give you a the, co the coordinate, the location of a point, and I say two, three, start off at the origin, go to, go positive direction two, and positive three. So always go X first and then Y. If it's positive, it goes up, negative goes down. Positive to the right, negative to the left. What quadrant is that in? It's in quadrant two. How do we know? Let's think about it. From the origin, which direction do I go for the first number? I go to the left. I go to the left. And then which direction do I go on the second one, up or down? So this puts us in quadrant two. What quadrant is this one in? Very good. Because starting at the origin, I'm going positive, and then I go down. So I'm in quadrant four. Each of these quadrants 
have their own characteristics. In the first quadrant, your ordered pair, they're both positive. In the second quadrant, what do we have? Negative five, very good. Third quadrant, they're both negatives. And the fourth quadrant, very good. So yeah, you start with the origin, go to the right, go up, go to the left, go up, left down, right down. So that's, that's how we do those. Those are all called coordinates. A point is a dot. It's also called, it's a location. It's also called a coordinate. An ordered pair. All of those mean the same thing. They mean a, a specific spot, a specific location on the XY graph. And they always have this At the end of this first chapter, we're going to get a little another thing confusing because this parenthesis could also be representing to mean any number between this and this. We're talking about intervals. So we have to be very conscious about whether we use, we're talking about intervals or locations. So far so good? Ordered pairs represent points on a graph. Points on a graph represent points from an equation. Determining if an ordered pair is a solution to an equation. Remember, if you have a dot or a series of dots on a graph, they have to come from somewhere. Here's an example. That's an equation. True or false? True, because there's an equal sign. Which one, if any, of these are a solution to this equation? Yeah, so how do we do it? We check. Remember, the first number is the x, the second number is the y. So in place of x, I put 2. In place of y, I put 1. And check if left side equals right side. 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1. That's true. So 2, 1 is a solution. Do the same thing with the other ones. So we have, in place of x, I put a negative 2. In place of y, I put a 1. And see if those are equal. Positive times negative is a what? Negative. 
four times two, eight. Remember I said last time, if the signs are different, what do you do? If I, I take the sign of the larger first. So is the answer going to be positive or negative? Then I subtract them. Eight minus one is seven. Is that true? No. And you do it the rest to the rest of us. That's how you would check your answers to see if if it's true or not. Is zero, zero a solution of this equation? Okay, now instead of staring at the board for so long, it's not going to write itself. You have what do you have to do? Anywhere you see an X, you put a zero. If you see any Ys, you put a zero in its place, and then work it out, and then see it both sides. Staring at the board is not going to make a change at all. I tried that before; didn't work. Is it a solution? Did you work it out? I can't do that. No. You took a guess. Yeah, you just said you took a guess. Zero, zero, and then I have three, four, and then I get two x's. So the main is like two x. I mean, three minus four is one. Okay, in my head. Okay, let's see if you're right. I'd say it. No, but. You, what you said was correct how you're supposed to do it, but the way you did it was wrong. You, your procedures are right, but your, your application. So basically, what, it's an easier way. You could just, anywhere you see an X, put a zero. So I see four times zero plus three, two times zero plus four equals two times zero plus one. Anything times zero is what? Zero. So these disappear. So I have three plus four equals one. Does seven equal one? So it's not a solution. That is the first way you could do it. There's another procedural way you could have done it. Whenever you have an equation and they have the same letters everywhere, you should always first step. Combine like terms. With what we defined earlier, how many terms are there in this equation? But I'm, I'm asking for a number. How many of them are there? There are six. Remember, a term is anything separated by a plus, minus, or equals, right? Here's one term, two term, three term, four term, five terms, six terms. Anything separated by a plus, minus, or equal is a term. We have six terms in this equation. So what we have to do, our first step is combine like terms. On the left-hand side, this is, let me rewrite those and we'll just have a better picture of it. So we have four X plus three minus two X 
plus four equals two x plus one. Can we combine anything on the left-hand side? Are there any like terms? Yeah, there's this one has an x. This one has an x. So we can combine four minus two is what? Yeah, so four x minus two x is two x. Apples and oranges. If I had four apples and you took away two apples, how many do I have left? Two apples. So these are both. How about my bananas? I got three bananas here. I have four more, so I have how many? And it's a positive number. So remember, the first step was combine like terms. The second step, you notice we have x's on both sides of the equal sign, right? So now we have to move all x's to one side. It doesn't matter which side, or does it? It doesn't really, but it does in the long run because we don't want to do with negative numbers. So here, always move the smaller number to the larger. Always move the smaller. When you have X numbers on both sides and you try to move them, always move the smaller to the larger. And I'll show you why in a second. So since they're both, it doesn't matter. How do I move? How do I move 2X to the other side? What's the opposite of 2X? Minus 2X. Very good. I do it to both sides. 2X minus 2X is? Cancels. So I have seven equals one. And that's not true. So it's not a solution. There's no solution there. This thing tells us that there's no solution possible. That good so far? Back to the graph. So everybody's okay. If I just gave you some dots on the graph, you're okay to tell me locations, right? What if, what's the location of that one? What quadrant is it in? Very good. This location is zero, three. Because from the origin, I didn't go left or right. I went straight up. So it's zero, three. What quadrant is it in? Well, it's part one. No, if it's on one of the axis lines, it's called an interquartile point. <clears throat> because it's right in the middle of both one and two. So you were right and you were wrong at the same time. But you at least tried. Nobody else did, chickens. So if it's on one of the axis, X or Y axis, it's called an interquartile point. What if we had 
two points. What if I had two points? What's the location of the first one? Yeah, I guess that's a very good question. That's a very good question. How do I know which one's the first point? What's the first point? The way you do it is pretend this is your line. Starting from the origin, move left or right, whatever the points are. When you move to the point to the first one, that's the first one. That means that's the second point. So this would make it point one. This would make it point two. That's a very good question. I didn't think about talking about that. So it's left to right horizontally from the origin. So the first one, the location is one, comma one. And the second? Yeah, it's my horrible five. Four, five. Whenever you have two points, you can now do a lot. We can do what? Once we have two dots, we can connect them. We can just we can create a line. How how do we know that's a line? No. Actually, if we're just going to start here and stop here, that's called a line segment. Hmm. It's right here. It's because of this. It's a line because it goes on infinitely both directions. And it doesn't go through the, it doesn't go through the center because only way it can go through the center is if we had one, one, and I say five, five. Only, only way is if X, X and Y are the same values, then it's going through the origin. Since that one goes through four, five, it, does, it goes just a little bit off there. So a line goes infinitely in both directions, but it never stops. A line segment starts and stops at locations. Starts at a point and ends at a point. That's a line segment. The way you represent line segments let's say our line is line A. If you just had a horizontal bar on top, that's a line segment. It starts and stops. A line would be an arrow on both sides. Because that tells me it goes on from both directions, it goes forever. And since this is just a line segment, it's just a stub. There's one more. Array. Starts at a point. and goes to infinity. So let's say we start at point two and we go that way. We call that array and it has just one arrow on one side of it. So 
the difference between a line and a ray is a ray, a line has arrows on both sides. That means both ends go to infinity. A ray starts at a point and keeps on going to infinity. So B starts right here and goes on to infinity. That's a ray. The line segment A goes from point one to point two. And the line itself goes on forever and ever. Everybody okay with that? So what can we do if we had a line? What can we find? Remember, one, if I just had one point, how many lines do I have? If I just had one point, I can keep it going. You have an infinite number of lines, one point. If you just have one point, you have an infinite number of lines. But if you have two lines and, and uh, two dots, then only one and only one line goes between those two dots. A line has to have at least two dots. So once we have two dots, we have a line. What can we figure out from there? Once we have two dots or two points, we have a line. From that line, we can find the following. The equation of the line, that go, that, the equation of the line that goes through both of those dots, we can find the slope of the line going between those two dots. We can find the x-intercept. What is an x-intercept? Very good, yes. Where the line crosses the x-axis. We can also find The y-intercept, that's where the line crosses the y-axis. One more thing we can figure out. Actually, we can find two more things. The midpoint between the two dots and we can find the distance between the two dots.
That's a lot just from two dots. And here's the thing about it, is they're all related. So let's begin. The first thing we're gonna do is find the slope. For slope, we're going to use the letter M. Now, how would you define a slope? How would you define a slope? There's a slope of the floor here. There's a slope on your roof at home. How would you define slope? You could do it in three words. Rise over run. What does rise mean? Up and down, right? Is the change vertically or the vertical change? It's the up and down change. And run is the horizontal change or the left and right. So how do you determine the change of something? The word change in mathematics, we also call it the delta, and we use that symbol. It, since this is a math course, I might as well show you all the symbols and everything. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this. If I had two numbers, two and nine, change is also the difference. How far, the difference is how far something is from one to another. How far is it from two to nine? How far is it from three to 56? How far is it from 14 to 98? How much? 84. Very good. How'd you get those? You had to do that. What did you do in your head? What? How'd you do it? Very good. What he did was we had two numbers. So he took nine minus two equals seven. 56. Very good. Minus three. 98 minus 14. So I gave you the two numbers, and this is the formula he used. So what if I gave you, and here's one X number, and here's another X number. Well, no, this can mean any X, because here's X1. These are all X1s. In other words, this, this means it's the first X. This means it's the second X. It's a subscript, counter. So how would I find the distance between these two numbers? How'd you do it with these? You subtracted them. What did you subtract? 
So 9 minus 2, 56 minus 3, 98 minus 14. Let's keep on going with the logic. Um, X2 minus X1. So it's always the larger minus the smaller number. It's the second number minus the first number. So that's going horizontally. How do we do it vertically? Let's see how this relates to our picture. Remember our picture, we had a dot at one, one. And a dot at where? Four, five. And we had this line here. So horizontally, we go from one to four, right? Because that's what that was that's where that one ends. So the distance here is four minus one, which is three. That's the length here, the horizontal length. What's the vertical length? Yeah, so it's five minus one equals four. So the slope of this line would be what? Remember, slope is rise over run, right? So it's four. That's the vertical is four. And horizontal, four over three. That's the slope. So this part here, no matter what we have, it's always x2 minus x1. What's the formula for the vertical one? Very good. So now, what this really means, what it tells us is this. This is very interesting. Remember, it's a line. It goes on infinitely. So from this point, from point one to point two, this tells us how to get there. From point one, this is positive, go up four spaces, one, two, three, four, and go over three, one, two, three. Go up four, one, two, three, four, and over three, one, two, three. We do, ah, I, no, actually, yeah, yes. You go, oh, you go both directions. Yes, very, yes. Was, from other words, from here, we could also do the opposite. We can go down four. One, two, three, four. Over three. Back three. One, two, three. Right. Because since, but normally we go to positive direction. We go wherever the slope is, but we can also do the opposite. Are these the same answers? What is what happens to division? Div negative over negative becomes what? Yeah, they cancel, so we get the same answer. So they can both be positive, but they both be negative. It's the same thing. We go down back. But as a rule of thumb, the bottom number on a slope is always positive. <laughs> In a fraction, the top number is the only thing that can be positive or negative. Either go up if it's positive or down if it's negative. The bottom number will always be positive. So, in other words, if you had a slope, if you had a slope of five over negative two, how would you rewrite that? You never want to have a negative number on the bottom. You never want to have a negative on the bottom. So what this one tells us is, okay, so move it to the top. Five over negative two is the same thing as negative five over two, which is the same thing as negative five over two. All of those mean the same thing. But this is the common, 
It also goes with the phrase, remember, rise over run? Do you ever run backwards? You wouldn't win too many races if you ran backwards. So that's how come the slope is the change of Y over the change of X, which is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. There's your formula for the slope. This is the rise. Actually, it's rise or sink if it's negative. Rise if it's positive, sink if it's negative, and run, because it's always going to be positive on the bottom. Now, where does x1, x2, y1, y2 come from? Remember, your two points are 1, 1, and 4, 5. This is point 1. This is point 2, right? Each point is made up of an x and y, right? How do I tell these apart? Well, since this is point one, these are the X and Y of point one. These are the X and Y of point two. So the subscripts tell us what point it belongs to. So find me the slope. I'm giving you two points. Tell me the slope between those two points. Looking at these, this is my first point. This is my second point. Whenever you do these, always to find your slope. Label x1, x2, y1, y2. That's the first thing you should always do. X1, X2, Y1, Y2. So what is X1? Yeah, X1 is the X value of the first point. What's X2? It's the X value of point two. Y1 and Y2. Because this is my x value of the first point. This is my y value of the first point. x value of the second, y value. Because once you do that, if you get that out of the way, you will make very few mistakes. A lot of mistakes happen if you just try to remember to read these right there. Because this right here is going to be used for the next couple of formulas we have. So the second... Plug the values into the slope formula. What is the slope formula? Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Y2 minus Y1 x2 minus x1. So what is y2? 8. 
and y1 is 7. x2 is 5. x1 is 3. Because now, once you put it here like this, the chances of making a mistake are gotten close to zero. But if you just try to go back up here, I guarantee you somewhere along the way you're going to make a mistake. And then work it out. 8 minus 7 is 1. 5 minus 3 is 2. And there's my slope. Leave your slope as a fraction. Do not put it as a decimal. Why? Yeah, because this tells me locations. To get from one point to the next, I go up one and then over two. So this tells me the relationship between all my points on my line. Any questions about it? You want to do another one or are you okay with that? Let's try another one. Find me the slope between these two points. What's the first step? Look at the steps I gave you earlier. What's the first step? You have to label your points. So this is our first point. This is our second point. So what's X1? Negative four, that's the X value of the first. X2, Y1, and Y2. And the formula for the slope is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. It's now plug and play. y2 is negative 5 minus y1. x2 is 7 minus a negative 4. Five minus three. They're both negative, so the answer is going to be what? Positive or negative? Negative. Only when you multiply divide. So they're both negative. So five plus three is eight. You can't have two negatives next to each other. Negative times negative becomes a seven plus four is. So our slope is negative eight over 11, which tells us from the first point to the second point, we go down eight and over 11. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, we'll do this next time. Yeah, but I told you I wouldn't keep you all longer than the first class. So it's already 9 20, 25. Any questions?